Thank you, Neil. Good afternoon, everybody. Now, it's a very theatrical environment here on stage, so I thought I'd try something. I've been practicing Ness and Dormer. <laughs> what do you think? Shall I have a go? Definitely. I'm not going to. <laughs> but if anyone speaks Italian, you'll know that Ness and Dormer means none shall sleep. So I hope that that will be the case for the next half an hour. Um, and quite appropriate for the conference generally, I think. Okay, so as you know, there was a vote to decide what I was going to talk on today, and we'll look at the results in a moment. It was very close. Around six months ago, I had an idea to try and come up with something new for the program to let the audience decide what the subject would be, which is great, but it also meant I had to prepare three talks. So that really wasn't so clever. But I'm delighted that social media was the choice, um, because it is a bit of a passion of mine. And I hope that by the end of the talk, you will agree with me that it's not a waste of time. It's quite useful and enriching for our professional lives. Can I just take a quick straw poll? How many people are active on Twitter in the room? OK, I reckon that's about half of you. For those of you who are not, I have a challenge for you. By the end of this talk, I'd like you to get your smartphone out. You've almost certainly got one. Set up an account and send your first tweet. OK? We'll, we'll come to that again later. So I have a few disclosures and credits for the images I'm using in this presentation, none of which I, I, I don't think are particularly relevant to this talk. So the results. Um, I was encouraged by the turnout, 66 voted, which isn't bad. And how to control CPE was even Stevens with something about the environment. And just leading the way was social media for healthcare professionals. I was in a meeting with a full professor from a London university who said words very closely to this effect. Stop wasting time on social media and do some real work. And I think that probably still represents the majority view of professional use of Twitter and social media, although I think things are changing quickly. And taking a step back, the way that we learn is changing. I was speaking to my wife during the week about going through the loft and getting rid of some stuff. And up there in the dust of 15 years or so, is my notes from university, all my textbooks and everything. I haven't opened the box. I wouldn't dream of going to a textbook to find information about anything really, healthcare or otherwise. The news is, is all online. This is data from 2012. So three or four years on, I'm sure that those trends have increased. Uh, and the way that the, that the print media is, is addressing these trends um, is, to, is to go online and find an online space. And I think we need to do the same. If I have a question, I Google it. Other search engines are available. So I am actually quite a technology dinosaur, believe it or not. So when the rest of the world were getting into mobile phones in the 1990s, I didn't get a mobile phone until 2003 at all. Um, I got my first smartphone last year. So I'm really not massively tech savvy. But what this has meant is that information is available at your fingertips all the time through your smartphone, or if not, online. And that's changing the way that we work and operate. Mobile phones, mobile devices are an integral part of communication in the workplace. I don't know what your policies are on the use of mobile phones, but it's pointless trying to ban them, frankly, because people will use them whether they're allowed to or not. So I think we have to embrace that and, and, and find ways to manage them safely from an IPC point of view. Useful to go back to a definition of social media, and I got this from the GMC website, which has got some really good guidelines for social media use for doctors. There's an equivalent site on the NMC um, around social media rules, regulations, and, and guidelines. So GMC defines social media as a web-based application that allows people to create and exchange content, including blogs and microblogs, with Twitter being a microblog, internet forums like discussion groups, content communities like Twitter, uh, sorry, like Flickr and YouTube, 
and social networking sites like Facebook and LinkedIn, LinkedIn being the professional version of Facebook, loosely. So if we look at all of those various social media platforms, I think they share some key potential advantages. They offer the ability for instant communication. There's no peer review. If you want to write a tweet, it goes out there. It's short, and, and that's good because we're all pressed for time, so short is very often good. It's an, it's an opportunity to engage in productive online dialogue with members of the public, with colleagues and people you may not necessarily otherwise come into contact with. It's web-based, so it's an anywhere sort of platform. It's always on, and of course, it's free. However, there's also a flip side to the coin. Um, there's, a, there's a sense, and I think it's true to a degree, that, that what you read online isn't necessarily true. Um, there's no rigor, and, and it kind of meets a need for instant gratification and a short attention span. Online dialogue can go the wrong way. You can have some unhelpful interactions with people who, who really don't know what they're talking about and aren't willing to listen to reason. Yes, it's public, but, but there's a line between it being public and available and actually airing things in public that probably ought to stay in private. It's web-based. Is that a reliable source? Who's, who's um, maintaining the quality, of stand, uh, the quality standard of information in the social media world? There's perhaps a sense of always on and never home. Because it's so short and punchy, you may lack a bit of substance. And perhaps, to an extent, you get what you pay for. I can see both sides of this. I think there's, there's merit on both sides of that fence. But the overwhelming sense that I get is that if we don't adopt social media into our professional lives, we will be like these guys. Okay, I'd like to take a slightly different direction for a moment and talk about the sort of information that we're sharing and what we're trying to do. In a sense, we are selling our ideas. We have an information economy as an expert advisory service within a hospital, for example. So when you're trying to sell anything, and I, I use that word loosely, um, I think a, a number of universal principles apply. Firstly, you need to know your audience. It's no good pitching it at the wrong level, either up or down. That just turns people off. And then they're not interested in your key message. You need to understand the need. And the best salespeople I've seen understand the need better than the consumer. So that's the challenge. We have to listen to the client, of course. It's helpful to be part of a convincing brand. So if you have a high-performing service in a hospital, for example, that's well-reputed, People will take you more seriously, I think. And of course, we have to be quietly tenacious. Nobody wants a hard sell, but we do have to be tenacious in getting our message across. So if we, if we apply onto these principles the idea of a hand hygiene improvement, something we've been, we've been talking about today, we need to understand the needs of the audience that we're trying to reach. The needs of an A&E department will be different to a surgical ward, and we need to modify the message accordingly. We need to understand the need and educate the consumer or the end user as to the need. We need to listen to the client. If, if we go in and tell them this is the way to improve hand hygiene, it won't work as effectively as if we talk to them and say, how do you think we should improve hand hygiene? Let's work together. Being part of a convincing brand we've talked about. And if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Tenacity is vital. So specifically looking at trends in social media use, this is some data from the US, just to really point out that, that almost half of adults in the US are now using the uh, internet, and with that, well, at least one social media site. I was amazed it was only half. And again, these data are a year or two old, and I, I'm sure that trend will have increased, and data will be same, the same in the UK. When I was looking to put together some thoughts around this earlier in the year. I tried to look for some data on the, the use of social media amongst healthcare professionals. 
And although was, there was some really nice data on, on um, basic scientists using social media, there was almost nothing on healthcare folks. So I ran a little survey earlier in the year that some of you may have seen. And the results were quite surprising in some ways. So it was around about 750 people responded, and this was an online survey. Um, a few more females than males. The age distribution was most commonly 35 to 50, um, mainly from Europe, although quite a few Antipodeans in there. We'll come back to that. And um, a predominantly medical doctor, uh, then nurses, then other healthcare professionals. And this was really the key finding, looking at which social media sites were used regularly for professional use by this group. And I was quite surprised that overall around 30% of the respondents used these sites regularly for professional use. If we look at Twitter use there, 35% um, of the respondents use Twitter regularly for professional use. And, and similar to this group by, by the um, results of the straw poll we did at the start. So because I'm a bit of a nerd, I decided to run some stats on this to try and see whether there were any associations statistically with, uh, between the, the demographic data and the use of social media. And to my surprise, there was nothing significantly correlated. I was expecting the, the younger age groups to be more social media savvy, but nothing came out as significant. And I don't think this was a sample size issue. I just think social media use is, is homogenous across these groups. That said, when I looked at the use of Twitter, specifically, some interesting things came out. So you can see by the top line there, I did a univariate analysis and then a, multiple, a multivariable analysis to try and control for other factors. And being a female, you're about half as likely to use a social media site, uh, to use Twitter for professional use as males. What I found really interesting was being in the middle age bracket was significantly associated with Twitter use uh, with almost a two-fold increase in the, in the odds ratio. The Aussies were not very social media savvy, so I don't know whether Brett's still here, but come on, get it sorted. And um, nurses and other healthcare professionals were more likely than doctors to use social media. So many of you will have heard of a mammal a middle-aged man in lycra. I'm going to propose a new term, which is a mammoth, a middle-aged man on Twitter, which seems to be the, the overriding outcome of, of the survey. And I was really surprised and, and kind of encouraged that it's not just the younger generation that's pushing the social media use. It's, it's across a wider age group. So I'm going to take a quick look at a couple of social media platforms that are close to my heart. Firstly, a blogs or blogging, and secondly, Twitter, and we'll, we'll then take a really quick look at some of the other social media platforms. So blogs are really fascinating as a, a new type of media. They've got all those aspects of social media platforms that we've talked about in terms of being short and punchy and free and accessible, and they're very easy to set up. You could do it by the end of the talk if you wanted. Go to WordPress or eBlogger and set up a post right now. They can be long, they can be short, they can be regular, they can be irregular. It's up to you. Um, they're often linked with other social media platforms in terms of spreading the word. So Twitter is quite often linked to blogs to get the, the word out. And there's a couple of blogs that uh, we've talked about already at this meeting one of which is extremely self-serving because it's mine, along with Martin Kinn and, and Andreas Voss, Reflections on IPC. And the other one is um, Eli's blog with his colleagues in the US, Dan Dykema and Mike Edmund, Controversies in HCAI. There's a bit of transatlantic competition. Um, I think we're just a little bit better than them, but it's close. Um, and we try, we try to share content and ideas as well. OK, onto Twitter. Um, there's, I've kind of categorized it into two parts. You've got an individual Twitter account and more of a corporate or team Twitter account. So from an individual point of view, the best way that I can explain it to somebody who's new to it is it's, a, it's an individual news feed. So you can follow who you like and listen to the new information that's coming in. 
I used to sign up to lots of journals to their tables of contents that were sent to me via email. I don't do that anymore. I've, I've deregistered. My email clutter is reduced because Twitter is my academic horizon scanning to pick up on the things that are coming through. I can honestly say I haven't had a single trolling incident on Twitter. It, it's all been almost universally positive. I've blocked a few people, one or two, but not many. My idea, the vision for me, is to try and make it time neutral. So the things that go out on Twitter for me is the things that I would do anyway as part of my professional life. In honesty, I don't quite achieve that. I think it does take a bit more time and, and consume some space in my life, but it's close to time neutral, very closely linked to the blog. Um, it's fantastic to meet people on Twitter. It's a little bit strange when, people, when you meet people on Twitter before meeting them in real life. There's a bit of an odd start to a relationship, but it does introduce the, pros the prospect of making new and sometimes unexpected contacts. And I think overall, it has definitely enriched my enjoyment of conferences. Okay. I'm just going to give you um, a little bit on organization accounts. So many hospitals, your, your own almost certainly, organizations, a, a few clinical teams and companies have active Twitter feeds. And if anyone in the audience is part of a team Twitter account, I'd be really interested in some reflections on that afterwards. I hope we'll have some time for questions and discussion. So this is for those who are not yet on Twitter. This is some simple guidance about how to get started. You go to Twitter. The first thing you have to do is create a username. And the trick is to make it creative and interesting, but not weird. So Martin Kiernan's a really good one, his EMRSA 15. Um, I'm really creative in my Twitter name, John Otter. <laughs> and I wish I'd done a bit better in hindsight. A selfie is really important because if you see a Twitter account without a photo, you, the alarm bells ring. Um, so put a selfie up there. Again, be creative, but not weird. Write a bio. And bios can be infuriating and toe curling sometimes. So have a look around, see what the, the lay of the land is. Creative and once again, not weird. And then get following. So uh, look around, following people's dead easy. And then once you've followed somebody, their tweets appear on your timeline and get tweeting. And there's a really good review by Deborah Goff, who is a tweep that I met on Twitter um, in America, uh, an antimicrobial pharmacist in clinical infectious diseases published in 2015, which includes a, a really nice overview and summary of the advantages of getting involved in social media. OK, so learning to, tweet, to speak Twitter, it's a bit of a foreign language, and it can be quite daunting at first. So if you look at your home screen on Twitter, it'll look a little bit like this. So a couple of things to point out. Um, this shows you what things are trending on Twitter. And yesterday, this conference was actually trending on Twitter. So anybody logging into Twitter would see our conference hashtag and potentially click through. So that's fantastic exposure. So well done to all the tweeters, the twits. Um, this is a, the interesting area. So when somebody tweets you or you get some interaction, it'll show up here. It's quite a useful email system um, for keeping in touch with people um, offline. You can send somebody a personal message. And then here's the timeline here with all the tweets from your, um, from your followers or followees, I should say. And you can retweet and favorite a tweet, which then puts it on the timeline of your followers. If we look at your home screen, this is where we see your bio, which is obviously interesting, creative, and not weird. And you can pin a tweet and track your followers and, and your following, which is quite fun and slightly addictive. And finally, looking in the mentions tab in a bit more detail, it tells you who's retweeted you, who's favorited you and your new followers and retweets. The last point I want to make on, on Twitter is some of the tools that are available. So at, at this conference, there's a nice little um, analytics package called Simpler, which is, has a, co a conference hashtags project. So you can log in and see what the trends are within the conference. Um, so a fantastic number of tweets at this conference. This was from earlier today. 
And TweetDeck is a really neat tool. So it allows you to keep track of multiple timelines at the same time. And if you run multiple accounts, you can see them all at the same time. And also preload tweets so that you can tweet as you talk, which is a nice trick. OK, I, I won't say much on these other professional networks um, because I, I personally don't use them so much. Many people probably do. LinkedIn, I, I see, is the professional version of Facebook. And ResearchGate, I, I'm just trying to get the hang of. It seems quite spam heavy, so I'm not sure whether I can recommend that one at the moment. But anybody else who has a better experience would be interested to hear from you. <coughs> I thought it would be useful just to map out my own social network. So from my point of view, it, the blog is at the heart of it, which is then sent out via Google+, Facebook, LinkedIn, and, um, and then Twitter. And I think the, the most important use of LinkedIn for me is keeping in touch with people. As people move on and change email addresses, you've always got a link to them through LinkedIn. There is some science behind all of this as well. People are beginning to analyze the data that's coming from social networks. And what is emerging is some, some new and potentially exciting opportunities for the IPC and infectious diseases world. So firstly, around surveillance. We, we've known for a while that looking at Google searches is quite a sensitive way, uh, from a public health point of view, of picking up disease pandemics, so flu outbreaks, the swine flu pandemic was picked up successfully looking at Google searches for the symptoms of flu. We can possibly think about using that more specifically in terms of healthcare associated infection. There's all sorts of possibilities for post-discharge surveillance for surgical site infections, which lends itself quite neatly to certainly an app, and if not an app, then maybe a social media platform. Healthcare regulation, there was a fascinating article on the front page news of a, of a broadsheet that was last year of one of the healthcare regulators, I can't remember which, had massive fun funding cuts. So they decided to try and use intelligent data by looking at mentions of a trust as a way of analyzing its performance. And I think we'll see a lot more of that labor saving application within healthcare regulation. Public engagement is, is a really powerful potential for social media. It's a meeting place with the public that we wouldn't otherwise have. Patient reminders have been tried through social media, so text messages, but, but also social media platforms to say you should be taking an antibiotic or you should not be taking an antibiotic. New opportunity for dialogue with patients, and I think there's some potential liability in this that we need to be careful of, but it's also an opportunity. If you look at the data around the quality of, of the information that you see on specifically Twitter, it's a lot more accurate than you might think. Somebody did some work looking at all the tweets around influenza, and I think this was again related to the H1N1 outbreak of swine flu, and they found that almost all of the tweets linked to more detailed information and were accurate in what they were saying. The minority didn't. And that, I think, is a, it's almost a crowd-sourcing kind of approach where the, the good information gets expanded, whereas the bad information tends to die a death. And, of course, conferences with a louder voice. And I think this conference probably has, is the most active on social media that I'm aware of, um, which is really good to see. To summarize, social media is not going to replace conventional media. It's always going to be an add-on and an adjunct. But I, I do think um, there are some potential risks. You could go down a little wormhole of time and perhaps not do things you really need to do because it's a pleasant distraction keeping up with your social media accounts. There is the risk of unhelpful interactions. Personally, I've had very few of these, as I mentioned, and we need to be careful about new liabilities. And again, I would point you towards the GMC and the NMC guidance on social media use by healthcare professionals. But the benefits for me far outweigh the potential risks in terms of improved exposure and useful interactions. I think the most important point when deciding about how to get into social media is what do you want to get out of it? Because that will depend on which platform you use and how you decide to use it. 
So there's some resources listed here, um, which are mainly click-throughs and some ideas of some blogs who, that you might like to follow. And the slides from this talk you can download now from my website, if you like. Thank you.